Sorry about that. Okay. No What's problem. Up? Not much. Are you you all prepared? I'm ready to go. All right, good. What have you been up to these days, Mark? Well, um, we just finished a record. Uh, it's going to be, well, it's already been released in Europe, but it's going to be released here on the 21st of April called Rising. And uh, we're getting ready to get started pretty heavily here. Um, I think about April 22nd, we'll start, uh, you know, touring around and stuff in the States, and uh, we're looking at something uh, to go to Europe this year again as well, play a lot of festivals and stuff over there. So the album's doing good in Europe right now? Uh, it's really early. Um, the reviews have been really good. Um, it's a little, you know, I mean, it's only been out a couple of weeks. It's kind of early to tell how good it's doing or whatever. If, if you're talking about, like, sales and stuff like that, I mean, it, it barely came out. And the release date, like I said, here is April 21st. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people looking forward to a new Great White album. Yeah, we're we're pretty excited about it. Um, you know, this is uh, the band got back together. I guess it's been maybe almost two years now, as far as all the original members. Because Jack and I were touring with hired guys for a couple years and stuff. But uh, when we talked about doing it. Uh, a new great white record, we didn't want to do it with a, a hired band. It would almost be like a cover of ourselves, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so we called the guy, you know, all the original members and stuff to see what they were doing, and everybody was really interested in getting together, and so we got together and, and uh, just been having a, a blast with it, you know. We made a pretty good record, probably the best record we've made in a lot of years, this uh, most recent one. It was like going back to the 80s? Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Uh, well, I won't say that we're, <laughs> we for sure haven't like re we're not trying to reinvent ourselves or anything. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, we just write how we write. That's how how we've always done it. But uh, I think we've improved. You know, I think uh, the songs are a little, maybe a little better than some of the ones in the stuff. And it's just. Uh, Everybody's really focused and playing good, and so, you know, we're just having fun with it. You keep busy every day? Uh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, uh, we just, like, rehearsed yesterday because we want to play some of the stuff in the set. We have a lot of, uh, you know, radio uh, acoustic things, and, you know, we're just doing a lot of promotional stuff right now. So, yeah, I keep pretty busy for the most part. Day off today, pretty much. I'm not just today. Going back to your uh, earlier days in the uh, Great White, whose idea was it to pick out Once Bit and Twice Shy to see it as big as it went? Um, actually, uh, well, what happened was we had an album called Once Bitten, so you know it was almost kind of the obvious follow-up album was going to be Twice Shy, you know, cause, right? And uh, our manager um, at the time was he was from England, so he was familiar with uh, you know a lot of music, a lot of British music and stuff, and. And he brought that song to us, and, uh, you know, we thought it was pretty cool, um, but we had no idea it was ever going to be some big single, you know. Um, and and nobody really felt, you know, I mean, the record company loved it, but we didn't, the, as a band, just band members, we did, weren't, you know, like over the moon about it. We didn't think it was... You know, we thought it was okay, but we didn't think it was, like, the strongest song on the album. So when they released it, we our thinking was, well, at least we have this song and this song to fall back on, you know, like Lady Red Light and stuff like that. But, uh, man, I mean, it just went crazy. And, uh, you, you know, it was one of those deals where the song almost became bigger than the band. <laughs> and now you have to play that yeah, song uh, the rest of your career. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time, you know, because, uh, well, for one thing, it's a cover song, but, uh, you know, when a song gets that that big, it just, you know, it, it's overwhelming in a, in a way. But it, it's good, it, it, you know, at the same time. Yeah, we have to play it, you know, and uh, I don't think that's the, that that song... Um, can be can define our the whole band you know, you know what we're all about but you know it's fun to play it it's fine it's good for the fans so you know we're fine with it
going back to um, 2002 to 2005 era when it was labeled as the fake great white right like what why was it really labeled as the fake great white because it was still technically great white right well you know jack and i you know her have heard that mostly after the original members got back together we we have heard this being called fake fake white and fake great white or whatever but um you know jack and i were the the main force behind the band from the get-go. I mean, it was uh, Jack and I that started the band. Um, a lot. Uh, the other guys that came along were um, put a lot of years into the band as well. So um, I think because there were so many hired people in the band that that the fans, you know, didn't like it as much as they do when you know it's the originals. When you guys go back as the real name, Great White, two thousand five. It was always it was always great white. I mean, I think um, what happened was in 2002 or whatever, I wasn't in the band for a couple of years. I was off doing my own thing, my solo project, and a couple other things. And um, Jack was out doing a solo tour for a solo album. And you know, when a singer goes off and does a solo thing, it, it's it's sometimes a little a little rough, you know, even with really big bands. Um, you know, there's the attendance isn't so good, and right. you know he's out playing his stuff off his solo album, and people want are wanting to hear Great White, and you know what I mean. So, so he called me in to play, and I was I was kind of done doing what I was I was done with my solo album, and so I had some time, and I came I told him I'd come out, and he goes that way we could play more Great White songs. And he was calling it Jack Russell's Great White, which, you know, um, I didn't even know he was calling it that until I saw a flyer at a show we were playing, and I go, oh, it's Jack Russell's Great White? That's weird, you know. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, so we did, you know, after that, uh, his solo band or whatever, we came home after that little tour, and we got some other guys, in the in the band, it just went out as Great White, not even asking the original members. We just hired guys and we went out and just played played our songs. And you know that was called Great White, but like you, like you were saying about Fake White or whatever, because it wasn't the original members. Um, you know, because it was just Jack and I, and nobody was really familiar with these other guys because they weren't famous or anything. They were just basically, you know, playing covers of our music. But when we decided to make a new record, we we just we wouldn't feel right if we made a great white record with hired musicians. I, I I just don't think it would have the same impact. You know, once we got the guys, I mean, Michael was off. He was, you know, he'd been playing with Night Ranger for four years, and and Adi was doing a lot of projects and stuff. And but they were all, you know, they all were excited about getting the band back together. So it's. It's been great ever since, you know, we're really, uh, we're having a lot of fun with it, and the, the songs are really coming together well, and, you know, we're working together good, and we're just having a blast. Well, I'm glad that everything's going good now. Thank you. Can I talk about uh, the fire? Sure, what do you want to say? The guitar player, Tyler Longley. Right. Why did he stay in the the club? You know, that's a question that nobody knows, I, you know, um, you know, when, when they opened the door, and I, you know, for one thing, the the uh, sparklers or whatever they don't really cause heat or anything. So when I felt heat on my back, I turned around and I saw that the foam the foam on the uh, wall was on fire. So I just I saw the back door open and the doorman standing there. So I just walked outside with my guitar on, intending to finish the show. I didn't know it would take off so much, but. Um, no one's really sure why he didn't follow us out, so that's a question that's just going to, you know, be answered forever, I guess. Was it that he went back for a guitar, or...? That we're just not sure. Yeah. We're just not sure um, if, you know, because like I said, it wasn't that bad at first, but when they opened the doors, I think that, you know, how they say that fueling the fire from oxygen or whatever. Right. I think it, 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 it got a lot worse. And he might have chosen to go off the front of the stage, maybe, to go to the front door, or 
he was just going to stand in there. I'm not really sure, but I think it got so out of control, then he got in trouble. But I'm not really sure why he didn't follow us out, if he was worried about his gear or what. You know, I just don't know. None of us really know about that. Well, that is a sad day. Very sad yeah. in Great White. There's a horror, horror tragedy. You know, we've done all we can. We, we uh, you know, created a lot of awareness for all the victims of the families. And, you know, we just continue to do whatever we can for the families. And thank God that a lot of bands are getting involved in it now. Right. We're closely in touch with Ty Longley's dad. He's a really good friend of ours. Um, and, it, yeah, it, it was just a horrible night, you know. One, you know, that I'll, it's, you know, I don't like to relive it every day, but I definitely right. something I'll never forget, and I feel so bad for all the families and everything, and, you know, I'm just so glad that, that people are getting involved on, in, you know, with the charity stuff and, and helping the families of the victims, because it, it's, uh, a lot of people lost parents and stuff, and it's a really ho horrible thing to be a witness to, and it was just a, God, just a terrible, terrible night. I'm, I'm, just, I'm glad that we're, you know, we're friends with a lot of people that started the Station Family Fund, and, you know, the fellowshipping is really what helps you uh, get through something like that, you know. So that's what's kept me... Uh, you know, it helps me uh, get through it and everything. It's just the fellowshipping with the families and the, and the patient and family fund. Well, I appreciate you talking about that. It's not a great subject to talk to uh, on interviews every day. Yeah, I mean, it's okay with me when it gets brought up because um, even though it's been quite a few years, you know, you really want to... Uh, get people to, you know, go to the Station Family Fund on online and stuff, and, and there's a lot you can do for them, you know, whether it be a pledge or, you know, sending cans of food, whatever. I mean, there's a lot, you know, you can go to stationfamilyfund.org, and, and there's a lot of information on there that how you can help and stuff. It's a, it's a really great organization, you know, started by by family members of, of the victims and and friends and you know what I mean so it's uh it's been great that uh you know at first we couldn't get any bands to help but now a lot of bands are coming forward and you know doing benefit concerts and stuff and I know it helps and they appreciate it going on a lighter subject how many hours you practiced a day when you were young Pat, that's so funny you asked that because uh I was I was just talking to a friend of mine and he's still a really good friend today, and, and he was my bass player like when I was like 15 years old, and I was, I was talking about what a freak I was because uh, I, I literally played guitar from the moment I woke up until I went to sleep, and even when I'd go to the store or something, I'd walk down the street with my acoustic. So I never put down my guitar, I mean, ever. It was just a complete compulsion, and... Um, you know, we were actually in a. I was in a band with this guy when I was like 16 years old, and we were playing at like we were playing clubs, like cover songs, five sets a night. And I wasn't even old enough to be in the clubs for half the time. But um, yeah, I, I I I really practiced a lot, and I remember there was a band that lived right near my house when I I lived in the beach area in Huntington Beach, California, and they were called Blue Cheer, and it was a band from you know the early 70s. Was it the real blue yeah, chair? <laughs> the real blue chair. I think one or two of the guys were the original members. Really? Wow. Yeah, and it was just a freak thing. They used to rehearse in this garage and stuff, and and um, this was quite a few years ago. I went to their house before, and they had like you know a forty-five of summertime blues and stuff. Right, know? right. I mean, this was like a long time ago, and they, they were really burned out, you know. And there was like you know drugs all over the table and beer cans everywhere and, you know but but every time they would go by my house i would just crank my amp and just play every lick i knew you know trying to impress them and stuff you know but uh anyways yeah it's just funny because i was just talking about that yesterday how me and my buddy we were kind of reminiscing about those times and uh how relentless we were with you know practicing every day just Oh my God! I, I just I, I would never put my guitar down for anything, you know. You're a kid and you have that young energy. It's just music, just is your whole life. And you, you know, I I mean, 
you know, I would sit there with like Black Sabbath records and learn every song and you know, I was so you know, I pretty much knew that that's what I wanted to do when I was that when I was young, you know, young boy. I mean, my friends would tell me, yeah, he's pretty good, but he, he'll never make it or anything. not that good. But, I mean, because they weren't hearing me in a band format at that time. I was just going around playing Santana, you know, with my acoustic, you know. And I, I didn't start getting into bands until I was, like, probably 16 years old. I started playing around and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I used to really practice a lot. Did you ever get to play with Blue Chair? Jam? Never, I never did, but our very first original drummer um, that was on, the, he only played on our very first album, our, the black album that just said Great White. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, our very, the one with Street Killer and Dickett and all that. Um, well, that drummer, he toured with Blue Cheer. Okay. But I've never, I've never played with them, you know, or, or open for them or, you know, play the show with them or anything, but we have played with a lot of very obscure bands like Iron Butterfly, and, you know, in off-the-wall festivals, you know what I mean? A lot of really strange billing. Um, in Europe, one time we played with, uh, on the same stage, it, it's amazing, Europe, I, I really like Germany and, and Europe in general on their festival concerts because there's so many different kinds of music to where in in California, or, or you know, when they have festivals, all the bands are similar in style. Right. But over there, like, we're playing a show with, like, Black Sabbath, Buddy Guy, Iggy Pop, Slayer, <laughs> you know, all on the same stage. And you know what I'm saying? And it's fine. And, and the crowd loves it. And they go crazy for every every band. Bob Dylan, you know? I mean, we're talking about music that is so different from each other, it's, it's unbelievable. And I just love it that they can put all the... We just played last year in Germany with Queensryche, Iced Earth. You know, um, Iced Earth is like heavy, heavy. Oh, yeah. You know, every song is double kick, you know, just screaming bloody murder. And then you have, you know, a regular kind of rock and roll band play after that, and the, and the crowd's going just as crazy, you know? Yeah, I just love that about Europe, that the fans just love the music, and they don't care uh, about the styles. Just They just want to move, and they just want to, you know, get into the music. It, it doesn't matter that every band's not Slayer, you know? They, they get just as into... Bob Dylan is they do Iggy Pop, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just great. I just love that about Europe. Um, you know, as far as their festivals, how the the music. I I was going. I went out in the crowd. I mean, I never do that here, but I, I went out in the crowd because I, I wanted to see Buddy Guy. He's such a great guitar player, you know, and, and a huge influence on even guys like Hendrix. Uh, loved Buddy Guy. He's he's way old school, and and just a great great guitar player. A lot of people are influenced, including Steve Ray Vaughan was influenced by Buddy Guy. Buddy Guy was one tight player. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. He, he even goes in a section of his show, he goes, well, here's my Hendrix. He, he, he's played like all those guys, you know. He goes, all these guys, you know, I mean, I don't know if that's a little egotistical on his part, but he wants people to know that Hendrix borrowed from him. He wants people to know that Steve Ray Vaughan borrowed from him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, good for him. I mean, he influenced a lot of people, and that's, that's great. But I, I went out to watch him, and I don't normally do that, but I go, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, Eddie Van Halen or something. I mean, nobody's going to know me. I'll put a baseball hat and go out and check out the show, you know. <laughs> I mean, it might not be professional, but I didn't care. I, I went out, and nobody bothered me at all. I just went out and watched a little of the show, and it was great. Pop, you know, he's 50 plus. I don't know how old he this was a few years ago I'm talking about, but, I mean, he was diving off the stage. I mean, this guy's like 55 years old. Pure energy. <laughs> you know? I mean, that, that was great. Did you ever watch Festival Express, the 1970 show in Toronto, made on DVD? It's got Buddy Guy on it. I haven't. You I didn't? Haven't. 
No, you need uh -huh. to see that. I would love to see that. Yeah, try to find that. It's uh, called Festival Express. Express, I'll look up online and check yeah, it out. Yeah, they made a movie out of it. It was a long-lost film that was discovered in a garage. Reels and reels of it. And oh it's, it's got like Janis Joplin, Buddy Guy, Mash McCann, a uh, few other groups. And it's all long-lost footage. And wait, wait till you see Buddy Guy play on this. Oh my God, I gotta see that. I saw it the other day in... And, and I was so blown away by it because I, I saw it once, but it was been years ago. Mm -hmm. It was Woodstock, and it was the performance that Alvin Lee did on I'm Going Home from Woodstock 10 years after. Yeah, 10 years after. Yeah, I, I think I sing that. I'm Going Home, that song. I don't recall it, no. Oh, my God. It, it's insane. And you know the other thing that blew me away that was a great, great performance was Santana. You know, that drummer was only 18 years old, and, and that was an, they were doing Soul Sacrifice. Oh, my God, that was an incredible performance. Yeah, it, it, Woodstock, you could probably find that on DVD, the Woodstock. Yeah, well, Hendrix, I got the Jimi Hendrix one. Yeah, he plays at the very end when people are, there's all this trash, there's no people. Yeah, I know. You know Eight you know, in the morning or something. Terrible time slot he got. Yeah. Everybody's sleeping. Everybody's sleeping, nobody's even watching a play, and it's like... You know, they're just showing, like, the, the footage of all the trash and everybody's gone. And that, that he, he, I don't know how it happened that he played in such a bad spot. Center of all those bands. But, you know, if that film was never filmed, Jimi Hendrix would have na maybe never became what he did. Like, how big he was. That film really made Jimi Hendrix, in a sense. Yeah, then I heard the Monterey Pop when he played the Monterey Pop. Festival, yeah, that and was, he burnt his you know, guitar. Really broke him in America. Now, he's very lucky that these shows were filmed. No doubt, no doubt. Because it, it did change history. And, you know, Hendrix, I mean, the way the way his career went, it was, it was you know, they just pulled him over to England, and, you know, he kind of became big there. And then, I mean, that shows you how great the 70s was, because, you know, like, you had to, you had to be seen live to be seen. There was no video. There wasn't really airplay to speak of. I mean, you know, if you wanted to go see your favorite band, you had to go see them live. So the Monterey Pop Festival is like it actually broke Hendrix, you know, and, and made him big in America. It's, it's just amazing the way that happened. How can one show, like, totally break a band, you know? <laughs> you know, great footage. He just, you know, tried to beat Pete Townsend that night and burnt his guitar. Thank God yeah, it was filmed. I love the whole story behind the Pete Townsend rivalry thing, you know. That was amazing. It's like, I'll do something that you'll never imagine tonight, and he ends up burning exactly. his guitar. Well, you know Pete Townsend's just going to go out there and smash everything. But, you know, yeah, I mean, that's expected. He had to, you know, pull the, the light of the guitar on fire thing, and that was just, that's history. And that will be uh, standing strong for another three, four hundred years, you know. Oh yeah, that that's that's, that's the guy so amazing. It, it's strange we're talking about Hendrix because um, I don't know if you've seen that show on VH1 Classic albums on VH1 Classic, and and it's called Classic Album, and they're doing um, just in a few minutes is the Electric Ladyland story, and it ha interviews all the a lot of guys that played on that record and stuff. I mean Hendrix. I, Supposedly, if you're just hanging around the studio, he'll let you play on his record. I mean, that's how crazy it was. Mm -hmm. So many people played on that record. Jack Cassidy, um, John Finnegan played keyboards, uh, about four different bass players, including Hendrix played bass. Mark Kendall could have played if he was around. Yeah, I could, <laughs> I could be on a Hendrix album had I been around hanging, you know. John Finnegan, he played on some song, and the, the keyboard player did some wonderful, like, Hammond B3 kind of stuff Right. on one of the songs. I can't remember which one, but he goes, I, I've still never even been paid for the session, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hendrix was amazing, you know, I, and I don't, you know, people ask me about Hendrix. Here's what I think about Hendrix. It's not just his, you know, buzz box, you know, sustain and, and the wonderful way he played electric guitar his his uh, mellow shit was so well written and and you know he just writes so good you know what I mean right and his acoustic playing and stuff was so amazing and the chords and the way he plays nobody played like that 
So he he just wasn't a, a great, you know, lead player and you know solo solos guy. The guy wrote amazing songs, you know, um, unbelievable rhythms and and you know, I mean the rhythm section he had was just out of this world. I mean, there was no rules. You never see that drummer chopping wood and just, you know, the ACDC beat, you know. Yeah. He was always just... All over the place. The motor was just, yeah, the motor was just flying with that guy, but there was always a really circular kick-ass groove going on without just doing the hi-hat, snare, and kick, you know what I mean? The movement. When's the last time you seen the Woodstock DVD? Um, just yesterday it was on, I think it was. It just caught the... Santana performance, and then it was it was toward the end because they were playing the Hendrix. Um, I forget. It, it's almost like this little theme he played. I, I don't even know if it's a song. He, he wasn't singing. It was just like gong 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 gong. Really beautiful uh, instrumental piece he was doing. It was it was probably totally on the fly, you know. That that drummer's yeah. crazy on that live D Woodstock. Yeah, there's like oh, nothing he ain't Mitchell. doing. I think it's Mitch Mitchell. Oh, I know. It's like you know the just, whole the whole um it, was it Mitch Mitchell? I do believe it was that he stayed in the band and I mean they got percussionists and everything at that on that little stage. Yeah, uh, that drummer's the sickest drummer ever. I mean he's up there with Ginger Baker and all the really top top drummers. You know, I mean. That's what I mean. I mean, had Hendrix just had some stock rhythm section, it would not be the same deal, if, you know. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, some of those grooves that were created, you know, I mean, it, there was some good stuff going on with the drums. It was almost like back in the day when there wasn't a lot of rules. I mean, I think that drummers these days are, they think they have to, you know, keep it simple when the guy's singing and, you know, to where like the Who and Hendrix and yeah. bands back then, I mean, drummers were just going crazy when the guy was singing. You got to realize, too, they, they had to fill up a whole big audience. PA systems back then weren't what, what it is today. You know, Keith Moon freaking out all the way. Yeah, you know, just the, completely like he's doing just, a drum solo, but he did have an incredible groove. There was a groove happening. He wasn't doing a solo. He just, you know, they were able to create grooves. It's almost like they're jazz drummers playing rock, but they're, you know, they hit hard. But they they want to fill out all the the spots. You know, one guitar player, yeah, and band. And you know? know what that did was because the groove was created, but it created even more excitement underneath. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There was a lot of excitement. You never felt like the song needs to move forward more. It was all oh, the groove was just created already. It, it was just happening. Stopping wood and doing a fill. Yeah, I know. Fill there, man. That's just that gets old for me. You say you played with Iron Butterfly on tour. We did. What band? Just it was just one show. We played. It was Joan Jett, Iron Butterfly, Canned Heat. You know, this was quite a few years ago. As Great White. As Great White. Wow. This was like probably 13 years ago. Just some big festival out in the middle of nowhere. I'm sure the Iron Butterfly drummer was another freak-out drummer. Yeah, they did the 30-minute version and it got into me, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> no it, doubt. And can you imagine that was played on the radio sometimes like that? It was, it was incredible because that song, the guy, supposedly he was all drunk when he wrote it and it was supposed to be called In a Garden of Eden. Right, right. <laughs> And, and but it sounded like he said in the God of Davida, so they just used that title. But how how that how big that song got? I mean, that was incredible. That riff, it's like sunshine of your love, you know. Ban -na -na -na, gang gang gang. I mean, you know. Sometimes riffs are just they're the coolest thing ever, you know. You a Yardbirds okay. fan? Yardbirds, first song I ever learned. I was nine years old. It was actually the very first song I ever learned off a record for your love. Wow. Yeah, I actually learned that song off a record, man. That was so cool. Now, for your love, was it Jimmy Page or was it Jeff you Beck? Know, I don't know if Jimmy, I know Jeff, I'm pretty sure Jeff Beck was in the band then. It might have been Page. 
I'm not really sure did, who played on For Your Love. I'll have to look into that. That could have been uh, Paige twanging in the background. <laughs> it was a big time. I can't believe, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Page, he played on so many people's records. Uh, um, you know, he was, he, he was a big time session player. He played on like Pretty Dirty Man and all, all, all kinds of, I, I couldn't believe all the stuff he'd done. I, I forgot how I found that out. I read about it somewhere. I think it was in a, in a Zeppelin book, actually. Do they list them all? Yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty much, I'm, I'm sure that they kind of list them all, and you'd be shocked. In fact, it's a book called Hammer of the Gods. It's all about Led Zeppelin. Right. My daughter got it for me uh, for my birthday a few years ago, and I was reading um, the, the Jimmy Page section, and he talks a lot about, they talk a lot about his career before Zeppelin and stuff, and he was he played on a lot of big name artist albums as just a session player. Hmm. You know, and, and some of the songs became huge, you know. So I was kind of blown away by that. Anyways, hey man, so um, I'm gonna get to my dinner. We're we're getting ready to eat. Yeah, time's flying here. <laughs> Yeah, I know we're starting to do, I know I talk about music, I, I can't stop, I just go crazy. Sounds good. Okay, well, thanks for calling. Thanks for the great chat, man. You got it, buddy. Bye-bye.